the science cares about you no matter whether you love science or hate science. Mm. As people come to understand the power of it, everyone's going to care. What we can do if we can change the laws of physics is something we can't even conceive of. While many things stagnated, the unforgivable thing that stagnated, the singular unforgivable thing, is our understanding of the most basic notion of who we are. If we are going to, every time there's a border dispute, go to a thermonuclear stand, you know, standoff, it's just Russian roulette with smaller and smaller numbers of empty chambers. These are the precursors of genocide, make no mistake. Your, your friendly college students with blue hair chanting from the river to the sea are talking about the deaths of millions of people. People will hear that and they'll say, oh my God, Eric, you're spreading distrust and fear. It's like, I'm a pastor. Shoot the messenger all you want. I don't know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Hello, my fellow CCP member. CCP members, man, but that sponsor money is fucking sweet, bro. <laughs> What's up, comrade? What's up, comrades? <laughs> That's right. Okay, let's get into it. Let's, yeah, let's uh, start. Let's, let's jump straight, straight in. Mm -hmm. uh, let's give a little background on the, on the subject of today's episode. Sure. A uh, big favorite of mine, Mr. Eric Weinstein, mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles, Los Angeles born. Mm -hmm. A mathematician mm. uh, specializing in uh, mathematical physics, mm. also an economist, a commentator, mm -hmm. gained, pro gained prominence as a managing director of Thiel Capital, mm. investment firm founded by Peter Thiel, who we mentioned a few times already. Mm. Additionally, he's known for his involvement in the uh, intellectual dark web. And he's been uh, featured on various podcasts and platforms discussing topics mm. ranging from economics and science to culture and politics. So uh, w where does your uh, introduction to Mr. Eric Weinstein start? Random short clips from Joe Rogan experience, mm. that's for one. Secondly, uh, he made a lot of interesting comments, including the... Uh, uh, you know, in in those uh, podcasts, including the one that we watched with Clint about uh, Chris Williamson mm -hmm. about you know the virus, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, I found out that was very interesting. Um, overall, like also he started the Proto Proto uh, podcast, right? Mm -hmm. But but I think that's no longer available. Yeah, it's defunct. At, uh, it's just on hold. It's been on hold for a while. The right. portal. The portal. The portal. Yeah, they they stopped. I mean, they him uh, he stopped doing it just as the epidemic was gathering speed mm. because uh, Brett was, uh, his brother Brett Weinstein, mm. he was uh, running his mouth a lot. I think he was actually the, the biggest- Advocates for the- Contrarian, yeah. yeah, for the dangers of, uh, you know, the, against the response of the, mm. for the pandemic. And right. then he got, uh, not canceled, but he kind of, his channel got demonetized. So right. Eric stopped. I think he only did 20 or 30 episodes. Have you seen any? Uh, no, I haven't. But I, I just know they exist. Yeah, it's it's right. still on. You you, right. you can still see it. It's less than thirty episodes. Very good podcast. Mm. Uh, maybe even the best one I've ever seen. Right. Great guests. Uh, the usual bunch, and so some new faces that I haven't seen anywhere else. Right. It's uh, movie directors, sports personalities, porn stars. Oh, nice. nice. Uh, Riley Reed. Oh, okay. uh, She she was on there and. Uh, Riley Reed was a. Uh, she's fairly new, right? Or is she like our chief MILF status already? She, oof, she's she's young. I know that she's not a MILF yet. Mm. Don't ask me how I know. Okay. <laughs> but I'm I'm fami familiar with her work. Nice. Um, yeah, me me as well. I, I think I first saw him uh, on 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 Rogan and right. on the Rubin Report, Dave Rubin's right. podcast. Uh, I think it was the first time I saw. Uh, he was uh, there on with uh, Peterson. Mm. I think it's the first time I saw Peterson listening to somebody, like giving them their full attention. Mm. Like, who is this guy? And then later on, uh, I saw him on, on Lex. He's been on Lex like five, four, five right. times now. That's where I really got into him. And recently on Chris Williamson podcast. Very, mm. very good. Very excellent, excellent conversations. I like the fact that, you know, how we introduced to him, we introduced to him in a style as if like he's right here with us. Of course he's, yeah, uh, you know. Eric, we all good? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, 
he doesn't want people to know that he come to China. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's a. So what's a what's a dark uh, inter inter intellectual dark web? Intellectual dark web. Okay, intellectual dark web was first jokingly coined by Weinstein himself uh -huh. in the mid 2010s, but the term became popular after after an article opinion piece was uh, published in the New York Times by. Um, Staff by correction by then staff editor Barry Weiss in the mm. New York Times titled "Meet the Renegades of mm. the Intellectual Dark Web." Mm. So the the term itself it uh, it's supposed to, it describes a group of intellectuals or commentators mm. that oppose ideas such as um, uh, identity politics, mm. uh, political correctness, and cancel culture in mm. higher education and news right. media across Western countries. Mm -hmm. They are, I guess, famous for discussing ideas that are outside uh, mainstream. What's the mainstream discourse? Mm. So, who do you know from the intellectual dark web? Can you guess who's in it? I would say, like, I don't know if anybody. I don't know for sure if somebody's in it, but I can guess. Like, I mean, it's not like a a real club. It was right. just uh, a group of a group of people. I probably think like Chijek is probably in it. No, no, not mm -mm. Chijek. Mm -mm. All right. mm -mm. Jordan Peterson. Peterson. Um, is Sam Harris in Sam it? Sam Harris. Right. The Weinstein brothers. The Weinstein brothers. Ben Shapiro. Douglas ben Shapiro, Murray. Douglas Murray. Right. Uh, a few of these. Uh, so the entire podcast podcast crew. Exactly. Like, right. Exactly. Exactly. There's a uh, Christina Hoff Summers. I think she's a philosopher mm. slash author. Like I said, they were uh, they had in common what they were against, mm. but uh, some internal and external factors, mm. mainly uh, the 2016 presidential U.S. presidential election mm. and the COVID again correction, the response to the COVID-19 epidemic are said to have caused some internal fractures within the group. Right. And some other stuff, uh, because you have on one side, you have uh, Sam Harris, who's a big atheist, mm. in the same group with Peterson, right. who's a, you know... Basically a Christian now. Uh, basically a full-blown full blown Christian right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they also... I think COVID was one of the the breaking right. points for them, especially with Sam Harris. He really distan distanced himself from from the Weinstein brothers, from Brett mainly, and criticized him a lot, him and bo both him and Rogan, right. for what they did during the pandemic. And uh, also, did they disagree, I think, on, on free speech as well, uh, mm. on the levels of free speech. Mm. You have the Weinstein brothers who are not like free speech absolutists, mm. where you have Rogan and let's say, especially Ben Shapiro, who really are. Mm. So there's like a lot of, I mean, the gang fell yeah, apart. Yeah, 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 I, I can see. Um, but like, I'm kind of glad that like they got popularized like that. And if you think about it, for the past, I would say the past five to eight years, um, I think Joe Rogan put it very beautifully. It's like we we need to stop calling mainstream media mainstream media mm -hmm. because they're not big anymore. They're corporate media right now. Like everybody, legacy media, the legacy media exactly. Now uh, more people are interested in what's going on on the internet than on the TV or on the newspaper, or on the magazines. Um, but for the past eight to five to eight years, we see all these intellectuals, they became like celebrities, like they became like rock stars. Mm. You know, they can go on tours to sell out stadiums and, you know, uh, theaters to give out speech. I think that's generally, generally a good thing. I would say it's like uh, nothing against Taylor Swift or Ariana Grande, but it's like, you know, um, I know they make good music, but at the same time, it's like there are very important people that are spreading these like very important ideas, but they need they, they finally gain that necessary, you know, attention from the general public. So I think it's a good thing overall. And by the way, it's a, since we touched on the COVID a lot, you know, Eric in that Chris Williamson um, podcast, like he I think he was the first person that I heard that brought up that the US sponsored that the COVID research mm -hmm. in Wuhan lab, mm -hmm. lab, and then and he was asking the questions like, "Did did we started it?" Like you know, that was the first person that I heard like you know a proper intellectual talking about that. So yeah, that's a that's another thing. Yeah, like like we did on that uh, uh, episode we did uh, on the podcast. Mm -hmm. I think you you said it right that time. 
like uh, there there's a hunger in the general public like uh, mm. you, you said a hunger for insights mm. so yeah they they definitely uh, provided that the this right. collective right. but i heard rogan at one point saying uh, talking disparagingly about it you know it seemed like they were uh, when you when you say this idw mm-hmm. intellectual dark web it, it seemed like they were like some group of superheroes or something right because that uh, that new york times piece that came out there was like a I saw like uh, some some scanned versions on it online, mm. like a spread. They did this photo shoot, mm-hmm. really dramatic. All of them like uh, singled out, like posing in front of some mysterious backdrops. Right. It's in the nighttime with the stars in the nature, right. uh, desert. It's it's, <laughs> it's 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 for it's theatrical. Theatrical. Yeah, yeah very very sure. theatrical. Right. Yeah, but they they uh, fell apart. Even though I. I like I said, uh, the, the biggest one was Sam Harris distancing himself mm. due to the because a lot of them supported Trump, even though like we don't support Trump, but you know the lesser of yeah. two, two evils. I'm paraphrasing. Mm. Uh, so because of that and because of COVID, Brett, uh, Brett and his wife they have that Dark Horse podcast, right, right. and during the pandemic, they had I think like bi-weekly episodes mm-hmm. for like a year and a half. I mean the podcast is still on. But their whole content mm. was putting down the, I mean, the the response to the pandemic. Mm. Should be told, both of them, I think, by by trade, are um, evolutionary biologists, so mm. they kind of know what they're talking about in, in a way. So what what were what were they ta- uh, suggesting? Like you know, stop quarantining people. Like stop you stop quarantining people. Stop the, the, the thing lockdown. with the masks. Uh, be be upfront about the origins of COVID. Uh, enough with the lockdown. Uh, don't get vaccinated because it's it, it's going to produce some bad responses. In, right. Uh, lots of stuff like really contrary, and I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not a, a doctor or a scientist. Mm-hmm. There's some obviously. There must be some truth, you know, in in sure what they said. I think they were proven right, but at the time, I don't think they were helping mm. with with the whole thing. So they got demonetized very quick. You know, two things about intellectuals. The first of all, it's really difficult for them to um, form sort of some sort of alliances, you know, on every single aspect of exactly. Their, you know, because they were so smart, you know, they look at everything issue by issue. Um, you know, when when you are like that, you are became you became a very unreliable ally, right? So that's an idea that I think Chris Williamson first brought up. Um, at least that's the first time I heard it. And the secondly is that um, because they value their thoughts and truth a little bit too much, so in a crisis like that. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody, the majority of them said whatever they feel like to say for the betterment of the general public, but the general public is not going to take that um, in a way that they hope they would, they would take. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, I would understand like why they got demonetized and why, you know, a lot of people seeing them as like, you know, public enemies or whatever, intellectual enemies on that front. You know, there's definitely a price you should pay when you are that smart. So yeah, there's a, but what I thought about the, you know, this group of people, I think that, you know, when I was doing a little bit of research on, you know, all these podcast intellectuals, right? The people that go on podcasts regularly, they, you know, doing shows or, um, they aren't necessarily the most welcome figures in the academia. That's what I found out, you know, like a lot of people, in the academia, they like are exiled from academia. Yeah, there a lot of them. There, they're, they're, you know, like I think Eric Weinstein, Weinstein talked about, like he something bit happened between him and Harvard. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Brad obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jordan Peterson lost oh, his yeah. tenure, like in lessons, like all, all that shit. Like, and then um, there were group. The majority of the academia, like you know, the 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 key opinion that they have is like they are famous for. They they have this they they gain the glamour by tackling some very controversial issues, but when it comes down to uh, doing research in their field, they're like uh, they're not that you know far ahead or whatever. So there is definitely an idea of the uh, renegades versus the establishment, 
Um, yeah, it's weird that they were all united by one of the things that they were united behind is, you know, cancel culture within higher education. And right. uh, most, if not all of them, ended up being exiled from, exiled, from, uh, exactly. from academia. Uh -huh. Maybe not, um, what's his name? Mm, the atheist, the new atheist. What's his name? Oh, fuck. Didn't my... Dawkins, that's a no, old, no, no. Uh, that's Sam, old Harris, Sam Harris. Sam Harris, yeah. Sam Harris, Sam Harris. Right. And I, I think I, I saw something. Uh, do you remember? This was just in like before before Trump, maybe like a year or maybe the same year. That this term started gather, gathering some some speed. This intellectual dark web. Mm. Do you remember that interview that Sam Harris? I think it was Bill Maher mm. with Ben Affleck. Right. Have you seen that? Oh yeah, I've seen it. Like Ben Affleck like, went Batman mode on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, like, yeah that was at that time. He's yeah, like yeah. he was. Uh, it was he, the Muslim Muslim question? Right. It's like he's, he he was like he he. I think he was accusing a lot of guests on the shows like being Islamic phobic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I, I know that. What about it? I think I just re re remember that because you know that started at the same time mm -hmm. as this. But yeah, it, it's uh, it's weird that they all got thrown together in this. Uh, I think a perfect counter example would be Andrew Huberman. Like, I don't think he's part of the uh, the dark web, right? Uh, no, he's not. But I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up. I mean, we we can put him in the same pot with Goggins. Right. There's probably a, a new batch of right renegade. Uh, we can't call them int intellectuals, but like uh, improvement gurus. Right. <laughs> I, I, I uh, the all the information I found about Andrew is overwhelmingly positive. Like both from the general public, like how many we have the Andrew Huberman husband now, mm -hmm. and also from the academia. Like he's a very solid research researcher, um, but at the same time, like he's very smart. He never talked about any controversial issues, um, and people are. I know there are a lot of people are very eager to sort of uh, construct a trap for him so that he will accidentally say something that he, he wasn't planning on saying so we can take him down or put him in one of those categories. But so far the guy has been smart, like he's been on top of his game. So it just shows you, he's like, um, I yeah, that's a that's thing. They bring you up and then they put you down. Exactly. Um, I told you, I, I think he's, uh, we're gonna see him come out as a, as a closeted Christian, mm. like big time. Right. Do you feel like, you know, I got this feeling. I don't know what you feel about it, and and I feel like Eric Weinstein is just one of those smartest people on the planet. That his resume doesn't feel real to me. Like I understand, like you start off your academic career with mathematics, and that's basically the universal language language of science. So we can tap into all the fields. I understand that, but to become a theoretical physicist, a mathematical physicist, and an economist at the same time. That just like for me, it would be like Andrew Huberman was a neurologist, but at the same time, he's also an economist. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what if, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, you should. Uh, the first episode of the portal mm. is uh, Weinstein interviewing P Peter Thiel. Mm. That's that's the the, right. the interview where I heard that uh, when you subtract all the screens, right, we're right, still right. living in nineteen seventy one. He brought a similar one. point in the Chris Williamson podcast. Did, uh, right. you, you should look at that. It's a it's a re great great conversation. He mm. was uh, he was canceled as well. Mm. By by the left for being you know accused of all these things you know a bigot a Nazi even though he's he's a a gay mm. and and in in the open a gay I mean a gay a homosexual mm. but uh, they 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 put him down they found a way to put him down mm. I mean I don't think he cares he has the fuck you money so right. and the credentials so I don't really think he he's bothered too much about it mm. speaking of science how did you how was your What's your experience with with physics during your formative study years? It was a it was a mess. Like I, the years I was there, I think that the string theorists were doing the last last push. You know, that's when you see Brian Greene and all those uh, Kaku, mm -hmm. uh, Michio Kaku, Michio Kaku, like all these professors. They were doing like a lot of documentaries about string theories. They were going on TED talks. And then back then I was like, you know, it's, I, I thought it was just try to promote science. But now I thought about it, I think that definitely did it to gather more attention and also try to grab more funds. Mm -hmm. um, it was a mess because 
I remember that I talked with a lot of my schoolmates from the physics department, and they're not buying. It, it was never part of the formal, you know, education curriculum where like. You know, you study, you know, general relativity and quantum physics, and then you have to learn string theory. It was never, a, it was more of a thought experiment for a lot of people. Like they never took it very seriously. Okay, I want to talk about that, but right. what I meant, how did you did you have physics during your in high school here in China or? Oh yeah, like yeah? since middle school. Did you do well? Yeah. Pretty, pretty okay. Man, I barely passed physics. <laughs> really? I I clawed my way through high school in physics. Right. I had like all like these uh, social sciences and, and languages and uh, right. history, geography, everything. I was uh, like a, a grade A student, student, but like math and physics, right. barely a D. I mean, the equivalent, a Serbian equivalent of a of a D. Uh. I I seriously, I crawled my way through. Through, through those classes. Man. I mean, I was just, I was thinking today if my uh, professors from from high school and university could, could see me now talk, uh, about to talk about <laughs> string theory, I would love to see their reaction. Right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's amazing. It's like I had a, I would say like the high school physics for me was really tough. Mm. Like I didn't do that well. Like when I was in middle school, I did pretty okay. But uh, high school, the Chinese high school physics is just full of like these pretty nuanced and uh, unnecessarily complicated problems that you have to solve. And then there is nothing interesting in there. Um, college, I think the Americans, they don't teach that hard, um, at least for public undergraduate studies. But um I always had an interest in the ideas in physics, but mm -hmm. I just don't want to turn myself into a physicist. Like I, I feel like that's really, really, really stressful, you know. But uh, yeah, like, uh, but like, thanks to the, to those guys. Like everybody was, you know, it's very cultivating. You know, do you think that we are like live amount like eleven fucking strings around us like all the time? That's 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 crazy. So I was. Uh, he always Weinstein always talks about string theory mm. every time he shows up on a podcast or, or a lecture or something mm. so i've been re-watching and trying to figure out what what he's saying mm. he's basically saying that uh, string theory doesn't work mm. neither technically nor in in the approach of its physicists so mm. the the point that he's trying to make i the way i understood it is that uh, string theorists uh are very arrogant in their approach Right. In the way that they don't, they 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 don't want to recognize that there m might be something else outside their field, mm. and he says that this uh, approach of theirs mm. is unscientific and unethical because they refuse to admit that they might be wrong, mm. and like you said, despite all this money spent, brain power, and time mm. invested during the last half a century, the mm. field hasn't produced any tangible results outside mm -hmm. of some right. theoretical stuff, nothing that's applicable in the real world. Right. That's how I understood it. I watched, I used to watch a lot of like these scientific documentaries, like the uh, Neil, God, I Neil just- Neil deGrasse Tyson? Neil deGrasse Tyson, like I need to repeat a name a hundred times so I can memorize it. Also alongside with Tucker Clarkson, <laughs> Carlson, like- <laughs> Kelly Clarkson? Chris Tucker, whatever. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so I watched a lot of these uh, documentaries and what I found out was that their starting point is definitely very, very interesting. You know, so you have 11 universal constants, like the constant for gravity or whatever. And then it's like, maybe that's one constant represents the dimension. So we have 11 div dimensions in, at the, you know, at a very microscopic level. Mm -hmm. And I'm quantum like, level. yeah, at a quantum level, it's just these strings vibrate at a very specific frequency and then I create a constant. I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> we understand that. Um, that's very interesting. But then again, if you look at how it, you know, you know, how string theory, uh, you know, square off in, in, in front of other like really dominant um, physics theories, right? Like the general relativity, the quantum mechanics, like it was way, way, way lower. Like the, you know, I don't think that Einstein started the relativity theory, the theory of relativity, like off of the imagine, like imagine, imagination at, a, at that level, you know, um, and then compared to string theory and then, you know, the other two were like really, really well grounded. You know, you can use it, you know, I think that GPS used that, you know, the general theory of relativity and then, mm -hmm. 
you know, the quantum mechanics, we're using, creating quantum computers now. But like, what, what, even though they make a breakthrough, like exactly like you said, like, what, what are we going to do with it? Like, you know, make a fucking quantum violin out of the fucking strings <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, he's, uh, he's saying that uh, they basically took the spotlight away within physics, the, mm, from theoretical yeah, yeah. physics, right, right, all, right. all the way to, you know, just purely on string theory and right. they're not asking these uh, big questions uh, ideas right, of the right, universe right. Oh, I whether or not that. we can traverse it leave the planet uh, find new f- uh, sources of energy become right. a multi planet multi solar c- civilization right. or, or something like that that that's what i find interesting about him when he talks about i think i heard him uh, when he talks about einstein he said that this uh, whole idea I'm not sure if this is Einstein's mm-hmm. concept, so mm-hmm. that's what I. Mm-hmm. But this um, uh, space time mm-hmm. is this Einstein yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, space that, time right. that he said this numerous times. Uh, uh, he says space time it's a map, it's not a territory, mm-hmm. and that we are that's we that scientists physicists are shackled by this. Mm-hmm. They're not thinking outside the box. What might might be outside of that? Right. I really like how, how he phrased that. Right. I just, it always amazed me to, you remember who was that guy's name that he constantly mentioned, like the most feared character? In your- uh, I, I don't know his name, but I know who you are. Right. He, he's just retiring now. Yeah. I th- he's part of the whole string theory like bandwagon, right? Yeah, he's the, he's the, right. the godfather. Right. And I feel like there is a, um, there is a sense of urgency among physicists like you know we haven't progressed any further after the discovery of you know what einstein discovered and also the uh, the quantum physics and then they, they feel this sense of urgency and then the string theorists are just you know according to eric is like they exactly like you said they waste a lot of resource and funding and spotlight and attention on a on a concept that's probably not going to lead us to anywhere but at the same time I always so feel like, you know, um, maybe for him, this is very, very important, a very, you know, potent issue. But for us, like, you know, we don't understand how much. It's like, we really, really, really hope to see that maybe, you know, the conventional physicists can make some sort of breakthrough and then just like use actual science to beat down like these strange theorists like as they claim like and, and then like we can move on for this but like when i was listening to the podcast i'm like yeah i understand that you are not happy about this but how's that going to relate it to my mortgage man like <laughs> you know i really wish i could know okay but he thinks he thinks big he thinks yeah he definitely very 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 big I don't know, when I think about physics, I'm like Oppenheimer, the Manhattan Project, the atom bomb, mm. and that's it. Like mm. like you said, I know GPS mm. systems, they, they function on some, in, they yeah. came from physics, right? All right yeah. what, what else? Um, I think that they found that like hard evidence on the astronauts in the international space stations, mm-hmm. like how how slow, how much like their time, time slow, dilation, time right? dilation, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, gave us a solid, good movie called Interstellar. Mm. That's for sure. Um, yeah, some physicists work, work, worked on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, uh, the rendering of that black hole, like I think it took them like months to render the black hole like that. And then it was the most accurate depiction of uh, what a black hole really looks Apparently, like. Apparently Oppenheimer, he was the first one to propose the existence of black yes, holes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Um, I was shocked when I was watching Oppenheimer and he said like uh, an object yeah, there's can be a double. small comment yeah yeah, 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 yeah. but like most people sort of give Stephen Hawking a little bit too much credit on the whole black hole thing but like Hawking discovered a Hawking radiation mm-hmm. which is also important like he he basically said like there maybe we can get some information out of the black hole and it's not completely black um and then, and then he actually, you know, we found evidence about that. You know, black holes can evaporate. But yeah, Oppenheimer was definitely the first guy. I would say that he was one of the group of uh, scientists who went that far and started to think that maybe we can find an object that dense in a universe that you can stop space-time, which is a weird thing to say if you think about it. It's super weird. It breaks your it breaks my mind every time I try right. to think about it. Last few nights I've been trying to listen to some... Uh, 
physics podcasts. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating, but uh, as soon as I, I catch on to something they're talking about and start thinking about it, mm-hmm. the conversation just moves on away from me. Right. By the time I get back, I'm already lost. It's like a weightlifting for a brain. Yeah. Sort of, I know. mean, the most I know about physics is from the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> 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 yeah. So uh, one of the, I guess not one of the, one of the the most uh, famous, most notable idea that Weinstein has mm. is geometric unity. Mm. That uh, it's a, uh, how do you say, it? it's a um, theoretical framework that he introduced in this uh, mathematical physics. Mm. So from what I understand, he is trying to, this idea of geometric unity, he's trying to um, to merge Einstein's theory of general relativity, mm. which explains gravity on a large scale, right? Mm. With, like mm. you said, with particle behavior, which right. deals with, with quantum, quantum, quantum mechanics, which deals with particle behavior on a small mm. scale. Right. And so far, this theory has been met with a little bit of skepticism, but also interest, mm. and he's still working on it. I don't know if you remember... This was like the not the la- the previous time uh, Weinstein was on Rogan. Mm. He uh, he presented this this idea. Mm. Uh, y- anyone can see it. It's on pulledupjamie.com. Mm. Uh, but it's it's it's. I mean, it's it's serious science. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I know what he's talking about. Mm. But he's trying to. I think he 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 sees himself in in this theory. He uh, that he can make another breakthrough and walk in the footsteps maybe of Einstein. Right. So I guess that's what he's trying to do. I'm I'm like, you know, um, to give a new map. Like Exactly. I, I think that the vibe I'm getting when he was talking about this in the Chris Williamson podcast was that, you know, that's why for me, like Brian Cox was still my favorite f- physicist. Are you sure it's Brian Cox? Brian Cox. I've heard you say this now a few times. Is it Cox? Yeah, it's, it is Cox. Is that the guy who's always smiling? Yeah. Uh, the, the, C-O-X, here? Uh-huh. Uh, okay, okay, okay. C-O-X, yeah. Okay. You know, like how <laughs> else do you want to pronounce it? Like, I, I also watched a few times uh, Physicist also. He was also on the podcast circuit. Brian Keating. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of Brian's in the Yeah, podcast. he's a colleague of Weinstein's. Uh, very, very cool guy. Mm. Very interesting but I don't, I hope that he can make some like contribution, but I would say that just based on his tone and all he described it, like all these big ass problems that he's tackling with right now. Um, you know, my, my, one of my professors told me it's like in academia, um, rarely you can find a area where you can build an entire building upon. Most people are just trying to add one additional brick to the pre-existing building mm-hmm. at a time, and then you would make the building as tall as possible. Um, when he was talking like that, it really gives people the feeling that he found this new uh, territory where you can, you know, there's a bright future ahead of this. But uh, I, I was kind of skeptical. I know that, may, like, I know that for sure, his theory might be very brilliant, may may make some really good contribution towards this, but. At the same time, and, and I'm pretty happy for the fact that he was pretty passionate about this. But uh, uh, the, the the thing I want to say is that don't expect that we can go to fucking Mars in two seconds in the next year or something. It's going to take a colossal amount of effort. Yeah, but he's saying like, okay, we went to the moon. We can go to Mars, maybe one of the moons of Jupiter, and then mm. what? Like game over. Mm. Yeah. So we probably do need somebody who's thinking that maybe it's not him, but you know, I think maybe what he's trying to to argue that the science, the physics community should encourage outside the box thinkers. Oh yeah, yeah, that's and for support sure. them that's because a, maybe these breakthroughs will come from one of these mm-hmm. pe- people who think like this. Yeah. Then those who are you know indoctrinated into the the field of string theory and just following the footsteps of those who can be before exactly them. exactly you need a you need a lot like a thousand bodies to you know to basically form the foundation of the this one significant breakthrough and if you look at Einstein he wasn't you know he didn't came out of nowhere he didn't come out of nowhere yeah, like okay. he he's he his breakthroughs also built upon like at least Newton's idea about gravity and all that 
And then before him, I would say like uh, the the most common understanding about ga- gravity was that gravity was a sort of like a field, like an electronic magnetic mm-hmm. field. And then I was, Einstein was basically saying like probably it's not it's it's something different, you know. So I'm I'm definitely glad to see that he's still working on this problem. It's like I because I know a lot of people have quit. I think that a lot of string theorists. You know, who bought into this? A lot of them were once upon a time trying to solve this thing. Like they want to put their effort in, but it's just so damn difficult. And then they sort of, you know, if you think about it, string theory was originally also a thinking also after the box idea. Uh, right? theory, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, but yeah, like you when you when you look at those those old movies and those old books, you know, this is not the future we were. I'm not gonna say promised, but that we all envisioned. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, Teal said, when you subtract all the screens, we're still living in 1970s. We haven't really made anything except these things. Yeah, exactly. This is the furthest we've, we mm-hmm. haven't sent. I think a man hasn't been on the moon since 1972 was the last manned yeah. moon mission. And, you know, we this uh, the late mid-60s, we, we started this age of space exploration and mm-hmm. then just withered out, not, nothing happened. If you right. know, Musk didn't reboot it, uh-huh. I mean, NASA basically cloaked, you know, were sending their astronauts to Russia to go to space. Mm. Yeah, there is a... What I'm trying to say, there's no, it seems like there's no imagination in science. There is no imagination and I, I feel like there was just, science just went through a huge period of like self-indulged in depression, in a sense. Like, Introspection. Yeah, it's like, I, I know that NASA made a lot of, you know, NASA actually made a lot of uh, progress in terms of, you know, we had a first picture of the black hole in 2016. Mm-hmm. That was huge. Yeah. Um, the detection of the uh, gravitational waves, that's also huge. But we were just at that, I would say like, it's like the darkness before the down, down type of time where, you know, everything seems so hopeless and, and boring that, you know, and every problem seems so urgent to solve and everybody is having this huge amount of stress on their shoulders. Uh, yeah, we just need to get through that. But when I, when I, we talked about this uh, ad nauseum, mm-hmm. that's my new word, um, uh, the three body problem. Mm. I mean, the ideas in those books are out there. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, that's like that's physics, right? Mm-hmm. Really, really interesting. I, uh, the show is coming next, coming out next month. The Netflix version. Mm. I I saw the trailer. I I think they're doing all all three books at the same time, based on the trailer. Uh, I think so too. I think there were some elements from the other two books, and they also brought it in. Like I I don't know if that's a good idea. Maybe from a narrative like point of view, they want to set up some kind of cliffhangers like mm-hmm. you know you know sometimes the tv shows does that like show you something that wait down in the future and then bring back the story afterwards could be could yeah be. okay so let's connect all of these two things physics and the three body problem mm. uh, for the past four years now i think ever since he stopped doing the the portal podcast mm-hmm. uh, weinstein has dedicated himself in investing the ufo phenomena Mm. And he has interacted with uh, various experts in this field. Mm-hmm. And uh, after four years, mm. he says he's, he remains skeptical about uh, the existence of UFOs themselves. Mm. But that... Just skeptical? Yeah, wow. uh, pessimistic, skeptical, you know, right. they, they actually exist. But he points out there's like a concrete evidence that points to existence of... Um, decades-long uh, secret government programs mm. that are shrouded in like UFO secrecy. Mm. And he says that his pro- these programs could actually might be just a front for uh, testing new weapons mm. or conducting retrieval missions behind enemy lines mm. or um, experimenting with aerospace technology. Mm. And uh, he said, uh, even though he didn't see any concrete evidence, it's the only area because you know he's outspoken on all topics mm-hmm. where he can't provide uh, like a single explanation what's going on. Yeah. And what is weird about it, and he mentioned it, and I also 
believe this is very weird that you have in the United States, for example, for the last two years, mm. you have these whistleblowers and all this news coming right. out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea that the United States have lost control of their airspace mm. has reached the highest level of US Congress mm -hmm. and all these officials. Mm. And they are entertaining this idea. So either, like you said, bring in the scientists, mm -hmm. debunk this in an afternoon, mm. or send in the military. Mm. So which one is it? Send and they, the and they're, they're not doing anything. It's like now wrapped up in all this bureaucracy and uh, right. they, they made aliens now kind of boring, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but something is going on there. There is a, that's a, that's actually a very strange thing. Like, did you ever watch one of those Congress hearings about that? Yes, UFOs? I did. Yeah, I watched the David Grosh one, yeah. Do you feel like it's so fucking surreal? It's uber bizarre. It's uber bizarre, right? It's like... It, it, it feel it, it to me is one of those like dreamlike sequences that happened in these couple of years as everything is so fucking over the top. You know, any uh, those people that showed up at a hearing is claiming that they work with the government, they worked for the government, they had actual aliens, somebody contacted with aliens. And if you watch these people from a different setting, you probably think that guy is probably fucking, you know, he's out there, like he's delusional, like he, he's crazy. And then you have a per people talking like that in front of some ultra serious yes, Congress per yes, people. Yes, yes, and yes. then it's just these two elements combined together. I'm like, y'all really don't have anything better to do right now. <laughs> like, wow. It's it's unreal. It's literally unreal. Like like you said, it's like brought up to a serious level that this uh, at this level is just it doesn't make any sense. Like he said, uh, like every time, because he really went deep into this, he met mm -hmm. with all these people. Mm -hmm. And he says, every time people say like, uh, these things are defying the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. He says, okay, how do you know they're defying the laws of physics? He said, well, we can see it. Like, okay, if they're defying the laws of physics, give me uh, a physicist mm -hmm. to tell me that. Mm -hmm. And upon his investigation, he found out there are no physicists were, were, were working on this. Mm. He says, if anyone's going to debunk it, mm. it's going to be the physicists. They're going to debunk it, like I said, in, in an afternoon. They're going to say, oh, okay. You that was up. like 15 minutes conversation. In 15 minutes, yeah. yeah. He's, he, he said, uh, he's, I'm not even in it, and I'm like the only physicist. Mm. Uh, but to entertain the idea, I like when he, uh, he made this uh, uh, interesting observation. He said, if you take like this kind of thing, this, let's say, UFO cover-up, mm. if mm. it was real, mm. how he knows it's not real, how mm. he knows it's not real, let's say this would be a Manhattan-type project in, in terms of scale. Yeah. And he says, like, take uh, NSA, the, the NSA National Security Agency, for example. Mm. Like, it was secret for a long time, now they know, now we all know that it exists. Mm. These people deal with numbers there, right? They're also mm. mathematicians. So he said, you would go to you would see a whole generation of students in the United States that, that got their PhDs for this. Mm -hmm. You would check uh, the whole, like that year who, who graduated. Mm -hmm. You would see that the, all these students are missing. Mm -hmm. You would find their addresses. You would see they're all working in the same city. Mm -hmm. Then you would know there's like a, an operation going on there. They're yeah. working on something. Yeah. And he says, uh, he was looking into, he, he says if aliens exist, there are like three different areas of physics which would require people from, from there to, to work on this. Mm. And he did the math, he did uh, his homework, mm. and his, nobody is missing, so there's no like real big project yeah. going on. It was a, you would be surprised about like how open or non-secretive the American academia really is. It's like, and also Chinese academia in some regards. Um, I think that China passed a period of time where like we need a locked up 5,000 physicists and high school students, college students, because we need a, a nuclear bomb. You know, that's what we did in the mm -hmm. 60s. Exactly like you said, a whole generation of college f physics students disappeared and it went shipped into that Gansu province. And then not every, next thing you know, we had a big mushroom cloud <laughs> and everyone figured out, oh yeah, that's how they went. Um, but no, we, like we passed that. Like I met a lot of you know, I basically know some people that work in some of the very sensitive industry and then they can talk about it's like, yeah, we're making some things. Uh, that's technically not internationally legal, uh, you know, and then in the US and then they, they're talking about like, oh, I'm, I'm working with the co-fusion project here 
or I'm working with the uh, the NASA or something like it. They're very open. There is not that not that much of a secret to you know attach to them. And then uh, what's funny about this whole alien thing is that um, if there is actual aliens, so like on the planet, U.S. wouldn't be the f- only group of or the only country that knows about this. You know, like everybody is watching. It would have to be a global cover up. Exactly. It's like the everybody has to cover it up. Like for what? You know what I mean? Like what's so potentially catastrophic that? Man, uh, when you look at the, the 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 failure, the global failure in dealing with the COVID nineteen pandemic, mm-hmm. if yeah. they couldn't control that, how would they be able to cover up the existence of extraterrestri- extraterrestrial life? Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense, man. It's like aliens crushed. Like the the idea that some civilization figured out how to do interstellar travel uh, and visiting us. You know, we're basically in terms of civilization, we're pre-kindergarten. Like, what for, dude? Like, what what's so valuable valuable on the planet? And then there, I heard somebody like, you know, one of those people that witness on a, a Congress hearing is like, ah, oh, they came here for the water. Like, seriously, water? <laughs> H2O, bro. <laughs> like, it's a movie plot. Yeah, exactly. Science. It's like water, like y'all figured out how to travel the universe, <laughs> and then you need a you don't know how to combine hydrogen and oxygen together. Uh, but uh, he did say that uh, he made an, some 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 cool observations. He said like if we like when we humans studied, for example, orcas, mm. which are like the the smartest beings next to us in the in the in the food chain, mm-hmm. I guess. Like, how do we approach them? Uh, you know, we we observe them. We build. Um, how do you say what's the opposite of natural uh, artificial habitats for them mm. we study them we hide from them mm. you know maybe somebody if if they are here mm-hmm. why would they show themselves mm-hmm. he made also a very cool uh, observation about you know the sentinel I- sentinel I- sentinel sentinel islands sentinel lives yeah islands uh, south of india mm. that island with uh, like a few hundred inhabitants mm. that killed everyone who who showed up there in the last few hundred years mm. basically the indian government because the island belongs to india mm. have put it like not like a protection around it nobody is allowed to go there mm. they're basically living in the stone age there mm. So for them, but like the whole world is studying them, mm. but they're not aware of the existence of even India, let alone right, right, right. The, the continents. Mm. So he's saying like, maybe we are like the, the Sentinel Islands inhabitants mm. and the aliens are like India. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, how, th- how would we even know? Yeah, I, I could be mad. We assume that they would want to communicate with us. Right. And uh, there's always this in, in the in the UFO UFO lore mm. that all these uh, visitations started after we detonated the nuclear weapons. Mm. That's where all this activity like um, started. So maybe I don't know. I I want to believe. I part of me believes, but if it's really like a cover up, mm. I think like Musk would be the first one to. I mean, he has satellites going around the earth. Yeah. He, he would know. He would say something. Right. I think that there is a, there are definitely, I've read this, and these aren't really like conspiracy theory or anything, but there were like discoveries um, in astrology. Mm hmm. Astrophysics, yeah, astrology. Or, you know, just physics in general that we figured out that maybe there's some astrophysics, that, astrophysics, As- astrology, Astro- yeah, that, yeah, yeah, the wrong <laughs> word, man. That's a MBTI shit. Anyway, so um, there were some f- discoveries that implies that imply that maybe we're being watched by some other civilization. Um, you know, in the there was a book before I, we talked about this before the three body problem, like how they found out that. Um, the aliens are watching was that they conduct the experiment with no observer. And according to quantum mechanics, you know, when you don't have observer, they behave like waves. Uh, and then they found uh-huh. out, like, why are these, you know, particles behaving like particles? Somebody's watching. And then that set up the actual um, stage for what happened after, you know, during a three body problem. It's like, oh, yeah, there are aliens are watching us. Um, but there are discoveries like that. The author didn't like can't make it all happen out of the blue. Um, but I would say that I, I want to, 
I want to believe that, you know, in some other galaxies that they discovered a lot of things that we just aren't capable of even contemplate yet. And they may be watching us. And uh, it's so amazing to think about it. Like, you know, because we know that, you know, at least maybe like tens of thousand light years around us, there is no civilization found. We have found zero evidence. So which means that if there is a civilization watching us, that's like, you know, millions or even more than that, like thousands of millions of light years away. They're watching as like what? They're watching like dinosaurs right now. Oh, uh, okay. You know, they're like, oh, these are dinosaurs. Like, but if imagine a civilization that can watch us live, you know, that they're also watching this podcast for some reason. <laughs> like these two idiots are talking about us right now. Hey, let's go. Hey, mom, come on. Come they're breaking on. the code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that means that they figured out a space time to a such level they can literally see into the future in a HD, you know, in a 4K definition, basically. That's crazy. Yeah, but okay, at the end of the day, we're always applying our understanding of science that they operate mm -hmm. on the on the same uh, same basis. Yeah. The best alien movie I found, number one. Fifth, Mars Attacks. Mars Attacks, <laughs> no, Fifth <laughs> Elements, man. Fifth Elements, elements. Oh, yeah. I, I thought that was pretty damn good movie. In terms of space opera is like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Arrival, like Arrival and Annihilation, these two films are, you know, like the aliens won't behave like us. And at Arrival, they just like, yo, we can't even talk. You know, we, our language are so complex, like give it up, man. Like we, Arrival is out there, definitely the best one out there. Mm, yeah, exactly. So, but for guilty pleasure, fifth element, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. It's, I mean, ni 90s schlock, but it's a good movie. It's good, and also, uh, you know, back to the er Eric, what he what he was saying. It's like, I was so surprised, like actual scientists like went that far too. Yeah, he gave it some l legitimacy by, yeah. by by him going in, into the field and investigating. I, I, that's what I I liked. I was hoping he's gonna come. I was like, oh, Weinstein is on Rogan. Let's go. The disclosure is coming. Mm. He's gonna say something, and then he's like, nah. There, there, there's yeah. no real evidence, but if at one point he said, if the aliens were here, mm. I would be the only person to understand how they got to here. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's a, wow, that's American confidence right there, man. Like, okay, know. let's continue. Um, um, what did I want to say? Yeah. Uh, what uh, Weinstein has one of these ideas of uh, also one of the things I, I like about him. Mm -hmm. The idea he likes, he calls it. He always makes up these these terms. Uh, the idea of managed reality, uh -huh. and by that he means uh, that those in the highest positions of power mm -hmm. are actively deceiving the general public mm -hmm. regarding the most crucial aspects of, of society, and by that. Biology, science, economics, right. politics, journalism, global warming, right. anything you can come up with. Mm. So, and again, he has these analogies, which I, I really <laughs> love about him. He really paints a picture. He li likened this situation as a, as a, as he said this on Chris's podcast, the last mm. one, as a tanker that flipped over on a highway. Oh. It's burning, the chemicals are coming out, there are dead bodies left and right. Mm -hmm. The police or the government is standing there and saying, nothing to see here, just move right. along. Mm. And I guess well, that's by a that, powerful example. It's a powerful example. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. And there's a lot of like for us, there's a lot of evidence that points to the to the contrary. Mm. And but people are being encouraged to to ignore the truth mm. and to not, not only that, but also to put down those who dare to question things. Yeah, you know, branding branding them grifters, charlatans, uh, right. conspiracy theorists, and we've seen that a lot in the last ten years. I think. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad that he brought it up because, for one, um, where we are at, like that's a freaking perfect example of like what's going on during the COVID three years, you know, while we're still doing those tests and all that. But um, it's everywhere, isn't it? Is it not? It, it's it's not. It, it No, it is everywhere. It's like, especially in the West, right? What what do you think that, you know, in your opinion, it's like, give, give us an example, like where 
you feel like your reality is being managed and you found out it's actually managed reality is not real like back home there there's a open secret that our government has been stealing the elections for the last 10 years mm -hmm. everyone you ask nobody is voting for them mm -hmm. and every time the elections come come around they, they win the elections mm. so that's for one in terms of I mean, we operate, we, we deal with very existential problems back home, but uh, what's going on in the West has started spilling over all over the planet. Mm. So like take biology, for example, what they're saying now about men and women, they're uh, rewriting history, mm -hmm. global warming, it's happening, it's not happening. You have the money, you have the funds. Mm. Get a group of scientists, make a consensus, sit down. Is it happening or is it not happening? Why right. do we have to debate this all over and over again? Right. There's a lot of these topics that we are constantly debating. Is it or is it not? Right, right, sure. Same as with these aliens. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going out there, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really affect me. Mm -hmm. But like example from back home would be this. Mm. I think that the... How am I, how am I going to put this? So you have uh, basically a mega industry on the planet that their entire profit came from making people arguing against each other. That's why, you know, racism is a great example. I think, I, I think that you, America could have solved racism a long time ago, but they didn't. It's not because the Americans are full of like neo-Nazis that just believe that they are the white superiority or all, all that bullshit. It's because when you have people that are debating on the national television, you got views, you can sell advertisement. It's like solving the issue will basically say that you can no longer make money in that way. And it's very similar to the wars in the conflicts. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like the, um, I had this opinion on, you know, we probably make more money uh, by threatening threatening the fucking island of unification than actually unify with them. You know, like Americans at the same time, it's like they, they it's but definitely more profitable that they keep spreading fear about like you know the what we're gonna do, what the Russia's gonna do. That's why it's like we never solve anything. The same thing goes with the climate change. You know. You do you feel it's actually kind of strange that the moment that Paris, you know, China and United States signed a Paris Accord to combat climate change, almost the next day we became the evilest country on the you know on the planet. Like we actually want to do some solid policy change to promote green energy, mm -hmm. renewable energy. You look at the Chinese streets right now; it's like how many electronic cars? It's way more than any advanced economy on the planet. Yeah, people tend to think outside of China that China is this big polluter. Mm -hmm. I mean, truth be told, you, you have a lot of factories and all this yeah. stuff. But when I when I travel China, I see these wind turbines everywhere. Like you said, electric cars left yeah. and right, more so than outside of China. It's so a, much more. We they never talked about like in the you know 2015, 2016 when we shut down all those like really we, we call it the uh, uh, deindustrialization. Basically, we need to shut down a lot of those old ass factories mm -hmm. so we can stop the uh, the pollution. At the same time, we we want to cut back on our production capabilities because we're making goods that's so cheap that nobody is making are making money out of it. So, and then there were so much unemployment that the Chinese economy had to suffer, suffer through that. There's a reason that right now, if you order food on the internet, like it will be delivered in a fucking 10 minutes is because all these people, they're working on this and they can't find jobs in traditional manu manufacturer sectors, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, like when somebody actually try to solve it, all of a sudden, because you are ending the debate, like in China, global warming is not a freaking debate, you know, and then you can't make money off of debates and arguing each other and then just like bringing out new perspectives and whatnot. Um, and people hate you for that. Like people will literally hate you for that. Like I, I, I think that the managed reality at a, I don't, I, I think that it's not like, you know, how Eric described it, you know, there's just huge powerful people. They just try to, you know, 
um, push a, us away from the truth and then, you know, like turn us into mindless pigs or whatever. I think that the powerful people just want to make us feel confused all the time. You know, that's why, like, that's why a lot of people buying propaganda is because it's easier to understand. And if you don't listen to propagandas and you really want to pursue like what's real and what's actually in the real, like your brain will burn out like on a daily basis and nobody wants that. You know what I mean? I, I do. I, I don't think they are like some evil doers who have this new world government, you know, one, one world government, this uh, apocalyptic ideas of, of the future, mm -hmm. these big conspiracy theorists. But they're just sowing division and they're reaping the profits because division is, they're monetizing our division. We are, exactly. We are, we are That's what we, they are doing. We are, we, <laughs> we are divided on every single issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, I mean, all at the end of the day, also citizens of the world. Mm -hmm. And we all participate in these conversations. And every single question we are divided. Yeah. And when you, this thing you mentioned, the, the, the global warming and this, I think this is also part of this Western self-righteous liberalism. Mm -hmm. Putin said it best, like you, 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 you guys in the West, you have already industrialized, mm -hmm. you, you, you've arrived in the future. Mm -hmm. It's like tell, tell Asian countries or African countries who are just starting the process of in, in, industrializing their nations mm -hmm. to go green, like yeah. F you. Yeah, exactly. Like, like the, the African like lithium mine, that's a perfect example. It's like in order for us to drive electronic cars, like, like how many Africans' lives are being sacrificed on a fucking ritualistic level, you know, just to make sure that we have en enough material to build a car batteries. Like this is hypocritical, man. Hypocritical. Like, They're all tweeting in the West from their phones, let's go mm -hmm. green, this dash, hashtag dish, hashtag that, but somebody is dying in Africa mining that cobalt yeah. or what, whatever it is in, you know, you, buy you, a Starbucks coffee, uh, tax, uh, I don't know, half a dollar goes to this cause and then you right. feel good about yourself, you can go and protest and uh, yeah, whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also the thing you asked me about, where do I see this playing out, this right. managed reality? Mm. Also with the with with the news, I think mm. most, I, I see it there. Mm. There are, there's no, I mean, journalistic integrity like what journalistic mm. what mm. It went went out the window i mean it's obvious you, when you go like you can go on these apps like telegram and you know these mm. dark web apps and you can see news that you can't see on on legacy media not mm. even on legacy that you can maybe even see on twitter or facebook on or youtube right. like we are i do i don't think and i i personally don't think eric was implying they're, they're like these evil doers mm. that are controlling, mm. but we are being uh, deceived, or at least we are being uh, conditioned or trained not to think, mm. not to question too much. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that are happening that are absurd. I think that's the main point. Yeah, you know. Yeah. That's... Don't ask questions. There's nothing. Have just move along. You know. Right. Just move along while somebody is profiting. I I personally feel I personally feel like, you know, for one, uh, the legacy media, the news are just so freaking narrative driven, which is something that Eric also talked about, the narrative driven media and also the narrative driven academics. It's like you have this built in uh, story that you want to you know, promote or you want to spread and then you find evidence that fits that particular narrative. Um, for one, the legacy media is definitely, I still have subscriptions to some pretty major news medias like New York Times. Um, I just read the title. I don't want to read the freaking commentary on that. It's like absolutely garbage. And then you have the underground news. And underground news sometimes is like so fucking mind boggling, stupid, mm -hmm. conspiracy theory filled, you know, have you heard of like, have you heard of ground news? Yeah, I'm using it. Are you using it? Yeah, yeah. Is it good? It it it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, it gets a little bit repetitive because they try to. It's not a news agency, but it's sort of like a combinator. Com, you know, it's you know you combine all the news agency what he said what he said mm -hmm, together, mm -hmm. and you make your own calls. Mm -hmm. um, be very careful of, of what you set up your interest in it. Cause like I accidentally set an election and my entire front page is all about like fucking election. I don't really care about this anymore, but uh, 
But in terms of bias, um, they have a bias meter on it, so you can mm -hmm. tell it's like okay, this is who's reporting more. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. and this managed reality. Also, we talked about it last time about uh, the war in Ukraine. That mm. seems like a very managed picture of what's really going on. Yeah, we're obviously being sold a narrative. Yeah, very obviously. I d I think that. Like I said it last time, it's like there is no way that according to the West, if Russia lost that much manpower, it's still going. Like there's no way. It's not China that we were talking about. Like Russia did, doesn't have a lot of people, right? So, yeah, there's. Uh, During the, the the Chris Williamson podcast, uh, uh, maybe you know something about this. He was talking about some CPI question. Right. Yeah, the Eric was attacking how the Bureau of Liberal Statistics manipulate a CPI number. What does it stand for? Consumer? Cons Consumer Price Index. Mm -hmm. um, what it represents is that it takes a basket of goods and services that you will, an average consumer would consume and take a look at the price level mm -hmm. and then compare this price level after a period of time and see like the percentage rise or decrease. So if it's a positive number, it means it's inflation. The negative number is a deflation. That's how I learned from my college years. Mm -hmm. And that what Eric basically said is that they created the inflation number to fit a specific political interest. And I found it, uh, man, it's so hard to believe that. It's, it's really difficult to believe that. Um, because... If that's the case, you will see that CPI doesn't correlate with other economic indicators unless you they fix like everything, right? And uh, I, I would say in terms of number fixing, like the Americans are not as good as us. Like we can make our economic, you know, score sheet, like box score, like perfect, right? But I don't think that he... I, I don't know what he meant that he said like, you know, the CPI number is wrong. You know, like that's the part is like he didn't elaborate on this. He didn't give out his own understanding about it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what what he thought should be the right formula. He just said like the uh, the Federal Reserve and then they were just, you know, this star chamber people, they're just fixing all these numbers. I'm like, all right, cool. Speaking of Federal Reserve and money, and again, going back a little bit, if you don't mind, to this managed reality thing, mm. like when people mention... UBI, this universal basic income, mm. and how much poverty we have in the world today. Mm. Uh, when people talk about that, you know, it, it's met with like, um, you guys are utopians, you mm. know, this is like uh, next level socialism, you know, mm. that this is not going to happen. But when you look at like when these, we, we talked about the uh, the financial, uh, you know, the crashes that happened in 2007 and uh, now at the beginning of this decade. And every time this happens, like I know it, ha it happened in Europe, especially in the United States, mm -hmm. every time they bail them out, they print trillions of dollars mm. every single time. Mm. So what I'm trying to say, like, how do they have money for this all the time but they don't have money to fix like these yeah. real world problems that we all you know, suffer from. Yeah, the idea of uh, printing money, that's from, that's a Keynesian economic approach. Like that's what the United States did. What uh, uh, economic approach? Uh, so I forgot his first name, but his last name is Keynes. Um, he's a very famous economist in, during the Great Depression. Stateside? Uh, I think he's uh, he's from UK. Mm -hmm. He's from UK. Like UK were same thing as Eric said. Like UK people should feel more proud. Like they they did something pretty amazing. But in economics back then they had this, you know, they had this blind belief, this uh, cr credulity um, of you know if you let the free market run, it will solve all the problems itself. So you don't mm -hmm. have to interfere. The government mm -hmm. doesn't have to do anything. And that that's basically fundamental. Uh, belief of all the right wing people like who believe in the smaller government um, because the market will sell for itself out. But during the Great Depression, we found out that no, the market won't sell. Like there is market failure. You know, like there are, you can produce so much goods to the point that nobody's consuming and it created deflation. And deflation is very, very dangerous to modern economy, like to any country. Like we think Zimbabwe is bad because they had a hyperinflation. 
So did we? Yeah, yeah. So, so did we? <laughs> yeah, but uh, if you compare that to what happened in Japan, the longevity of the crisis is like hyperinflation. It's relatively easy to stop, but like deflation, you can't really stop it. So they, they they're afraid of that. So that's why they're printing money. Um, but contrary to a lot of people's belief that you know they are just printing cash out there. Um, what they're believing is that if you increase people's spending and then just lower the interest rate, you will it will stimulus the economy and then make it back to you know if you give people more money, they would like to spend on something and then you know you st- stabilize the price level. Uh, what you don't want to see is that you are sitting on a bunch of cash and its value is actually increasing. That's what deflation means. It's actually very horrible. Like that's what China is going through right now. Mm. So if like every day, like me and my wife, we talked about this. It's like every time we see a nice restaurant and a very expensive, we are not going to spend money to that restaurant. We're just going to wait it out until like eventually that restaurant has zero, zero customers. It will drop down some discount and then we'll just go eat there. But in terms of the restaurants, from the restaurant's perspective, it's absolutely horrible. So deflation is definitely more scarier. It's, it's, it's much scarier than the inflation. Um, that's why they print the money all the time. Like I don't agree on the, but the thing I don't agree is that I, I'm all for you bailed out the banks, but you still need to hold those bankers accountable afterwards. Like we solve your problem now. Here, somebody got to go to jail. Like whatever you guys did was wrong. It was a fraud. Like what happened in 2007? It was just I think like two people went to jail. Maybe yeah, it's just two or three people went to jail, and all these bankers they walk off with all these like big ass bonuses. Mm-hmm. I thought that was absolutely wrong. Like that set us example so bad that you know now I thought about it. I think that America lost I would say sixty percent of its credibility internationally. Based solely based on what it rea- how they reacted in the 2007, and then now we're just dealing with the repercussions. Really, like it, everything on the planet is like, if you think about it, it's just dealing with the repercussions of 2007. It had such a strong ripples in history that it's just like, you know, I think that was probably one of the reasons why the, all these elites want to make us stupid and don't think about this because mm-hmm. like how are you how are you gonna get away with this man like seriously like uh you are all these money that making all these people that made so much money illegally and they can walk away from this and then you call it a buy a, a moral hazard i'm <laughs> like i bro like look if there's a famine and the people on the streets are eating each other like because they have to survive like i would want to call that a moral hazard you got a group of the most well-educated people on the fucking planet made some conscious decision to exploit people that's not a moral hazard that's just illegal that's like <laughs> damn right it is you know <clears throat> so uh speaking of eric mm-hmm. verdict Verdict. What's your opinion of him overall? I'm gonna put a Eric card. Like, what do you think? Mm. <laughs> mm, nice. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, the most frequent criticisms uh, I've heard of him, right, is that he holds a very high opinion of himself. Mm. Uh, on several podcasts, I've heard him say, I've heard him mention that. Within his own family, there are like two or three Nobel winning ideas. Mm. I've even heard him entertain thoughts of running the government by himself. Mm. Uh, people say that um, um, he talks in circles, that uh, he has an answer for everything. Mm. I also once, the only thing I think that might didn't really, I'm nitpicking here, but since we're talking, mm. Uh, the way he responded to comments made by uh, Tim Dillon, which was which were obviously intended as a joke. Mm. Remember that? Oh, yeah. uh, Tim Dillon said, like, uh, you know, people always say Eric Weinstein is, you know, so smart. What has he ever invented? What did he ever do? You know, right, right, right. and uh, he was a guest on Rogan after that. And he re- really kind of embarrassed himself in, mm. in his reaction. He, he, he went really, hard on yeah, Tim Dillon. Yeah, he, right? he really took, took it serious, right. took, took it to heart. Mm-hmm. But uh, disregarding all of that, uh, similar to Peterson, mm-hmm. what I the thing I 
like the most about mm. Weinstein is his sense of urgency mm. uh, when he talks about these uh, critical issues of our time, particularly the the the, oh, yeah. the, the, the failure of institutions. Mm. That's what I really like. Mm. I also I highly I told you this many times. I highly admire his uh, eloquence, his intellect, his ability to not only to to talk about, but also to communicate these big right, ideas. Right, right, right. In terms of this physics stuff and, and science, I think he really has a visionary mind. Mm. He's consistently thinking outside the box on, on all topics. Right. And his passion for, for, for physics has brought up, has sparked an interest in me. Like I told you, right, I've been right. watching these, these physics podcasts, even right. though I don't understand anything, but it's so intriguing though. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 They all have like amazing visuals all the time. Like, they do. Yeah. I think he will be well remembered in history, even if nothing comes off of this uh, geometric unity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, people like him are needed. Mm. I don't think, I mean, he, he pulled away when he was kind of getting not too big, but too loud in mm. his uh, criticisms of. Of, of many things so I admire him for that uh, as well right. and from where I'm sitting it's just my subjective point of view mm -hmm. I'm a uh, nobody to talk on this but from where I'm sitting he to me he seems like one of the smartest people in the world right I I think that I, I, I agree with you like I do you feel like personally that he's you know he's re he, he really thinks we're very high off of himself do you got an impression from him I do but uh do you think like if if Einstein was alive today and he went Bro, that would be amazing and if, if we see he, Einstein if, on a if podcast we, man. if we if, if we had the opportunity to see hours and hours of Einstein talking right we we can only see I think maybe there's only a few short videos mm -hmm. of Einstein there's you know books and articles right. but most of the, I'm pretty sure we would say he's full of himself yeah how can you not be exactly I I, I feel like it's a necessary flaw to have yeah. when you expose yourself like that in the public. And, all the uh, artists, sorry for interrupting, mm -hmm. all, when, you, when we look at all these, that we had the opportunity, now we have recordings and now in the modern age of these artists like musicians and they're all full of themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think sure. one goes with the other. Mm. I was, I had the same impression and also I think that kind of contradicts to what he said about the exclu exclusivity, the necessary exclusivity of of academia, um, I I think that what exactly are you doing right now is you're attracting a lot of unqualified people to the academia. Um, you know, academia for me always has been this kind of behind the door, like very secretive type of you know society. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of intellect and a lot of time and effort to set a step into this. It's not a you know, but at the same times, like I feel like he set a lot of good examples on how we should approach various very controversial issues. Like um, I was summing it up with this one thing that he talked about. It's about the gender issue. Mm. And he didn't go as like, you know, oh, there are only two genders. Yes, yes. He yes. actually find mm -hmm. a very solid middle ground. It's like the nature solid, prefer right? binary gender setups, like male and female, like we're good. But they are all liars. You don't want those all liars to feel unloved and excluded from a society. I'm like, that's such a solid point. I think everybody can rally behind that. How difficult is it to come towards a common understanding on that level? It's, it's not difficult to understand. We know that there are some people who are in a, they, they have like, you know, they're, they're the broad board borderline problems. Like, you know, they're neither male or female, like asexual, asexual. Like we know they exist. You know, we know that somebody has gendered uh, dysphoria. Th dysphoria. So like the way he did, the way he elaborated his ideas on that particular issue is just such amazing. With understanding and with, compassion. Kind of with understanding and compassion, and also he didn't compromise his scientific understanding about the issue. You know, he didn't go ultra like you know Jordan Peterson on, his, on Chris Williamson's ass. Like I, like I, I wish like I, at least on that aspect, I definitely hope that more. You know, intellectuals or scientists can be more Eric. Like we can, we can handle. Like if you're just like appear to be a very egoistic. Like yeah, we yeah, sure, why not, man? You know, 
I feel like Kanye West already set the bar like really, <laughs> really, really, really appropriate for us to accept those figures. But anyways, all right, man. All I'm right. The, that was solid, man. Always. Nice. I, uh...